Okay, guys. Let's get started. Let's get started with today's lecture. Um, more on causality. More on causality. So, you know, as I had uh, mentioned uh, last time, um, talking about causality, we, we realized that this is actually really important. So this is a point that I want to hammer home, which is why I decided to dedicate another lecture, so a second lecture on causality today. So when you look at Blackboard, the program will just be pushed one week to the back, or one lecture to the, to, to the back. Yeah? So we'll talk about a research process um, on uh, the next lecture, not today. So instead I want to talk more about causality and come back to that. But before that, two things. While it is seminar week, uh, I hope that it's all working out. You know, um, you, uh, some of you already had the tutorial. Those of you who didn't have it yet, keep in mind, this week is the tutorial. You have your assignment. You bring your assignment to the, to the tutorial and hopefully, hopefully this is all working out. Yeah? Is it working out, tutorials? Yeah, tutorials are good. Okay. Okay, so a second thing before we start. You know, I have a, um, actually a second lecture, and in that lecture I'm going to talk about um, uh, something else. It's called actually the wisdom of the crowd. And if you stay with us, maybe in the next year you're going to hear about that in my second year lecture that I gave. It's called Analytical Sociology. But in that context, I would ask you to go to this website now. And there you see, there you find a little survey. And there's going to be a question. Well, actually, there's going to be a picture. There's going to be a picture of a cow. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you what you think what the weight of this cow is. Yeah. So please fill that out. And I'm going to tell you more about what this is all about next week as well. Yeah? So, but it is actually for my second year lecture. And I'm kind of keen to use you guys here to collect the data that I'm going to talk about on Friday in the behind this. you're wondering if they actually that on this picture there are two cows, you know, I'm talking about the cow in the forest. So this is research in practice actually. Yeah? So this is a little study that I'm doing with you guys now. There is some real science behind that. You know, if you're more interested in that in the second year, I'm giving a lecture for analytical sociology. And then we talk about all these kind of crazy things. Uh, this is actually now called the wisdom of the crowds. Maybe you heard about that. It's about the wisdom of the crowds. Or it's about swarm intelligence. You know, and right now you guys are my swarm. And I want to prove that you are incredibly intelligent. I'm pretty sure you are. So how is this going? Is this okay? People to fill it out? Yeah, okay, well I'm going to, going to start now nevertheless. So, uh, as I said, I will talk about, I'm going to give you a little debrief um, uh, during the next lecture, and uh, if you're more interested in that in my second year lecture, it's all about these kind of crazy things. Okay, so let me move on now and talk more about causality. Yeah. 
So uh, last time, you know, I, I introduced uh, this idea, okay, what is causality, you know, making a causal link from one to the other, and I introduced three threats that we have for causality. Yeah? Reverse causality, basically you think it goes from the one direction to the other, but in fact it's the other way around. Right? And then we started talking about spurious relationships where you think there actually is a, is a, is a connection between two things, but actually there's none uh, because of something else. And this is sort of where we got stuck, and that's sort of where I, I don't know, now I'm going to pick up again. And then the last one is sort of an omitted variable, which is basically you forgot to consider something else that might actually change your view on how you think that these two things are related with each other. Yeah? But all of these things are, these, these are sort of three threads towards making, I don't know, a causal claim, stuff that you need to consider when you see two things seem to go along with each other, but maybe not necessarily they, um, they are causally related with each other. Yeah? So I had talked about the reverse causality before with the spurious relationship. I had started about that, and today I want to talk a little more about that. So I'm going a little more into detail here uh, about how spurious relationships can come about, in particular, I'll talk a little more about coincidence, or sometimes things just happening by chance, which is a little crazy to think about it, because our brain is really bad in, in understanding that sometimes things just happen by chance, or sometimes things just don't happen by chance. We, we seem to find, to tend to find meaning. That's sort of just how we are programmed in a way. That's how our brain works. We, we, we look for patterns, but sometimes even the most beautiful patterns are just coming about by chance. And uh, the second uh, element here is an unseen factor. That's something else that is driving the things that are related with each other. So maybe we have a relationship between X and Y, and it looks like they are related with each other, but in fact both are driven by a Z or by something else. Something that you haven't seen yet. Yeah. That's sort of an unseen factor that can affect all of them. And then omitted variables. But I will hopefully talk a little more. Okay, so spurious relationships, very important. Spurious relationship meaning something looks like it is associated with each other, but actually it's not really. Yeah? And that context, keep in mind, correlation is not causation. When two things correlate, you know, the one goes up and the other one goes up, it does not necessarily mean that there's a causal relationship between these two things. Yeah? However, when you have a causal relationship, sort of, things are correlated. So things can, be, things can be correlated with each other, but not causal, causally linked with each other. But when they are causally linked with each other, almost always they are also correlated with each other. So that was sort of like this graph, you know, to understand how, where we are, and how these things are put together. And then you find these things, so now actually I was, um, uh, I was picking up some, some, some slides, actually, you know, I got that from Owen, you know, Owen, uh, he gave me these slides about stuff that you can find about crazy correlations. Yeah. So this is now a plot. You see a number of years on the x-axis. On the y-axis, you see the number of cheese uh, uh, consumption. And the other line is the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bedsheets. Wow, this seems to correlate quite well, you know? Look at that. So apparently, Eating more cheese makes you more likely to die in your bad sheets. Yeah. So you see, this is sort of now, I don't know, of course, um, it doesn't make sense to establish such a relationship, right? Or here, another one, uh, you know, this is real data. This is not something that I made up with. Yeah? So the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool over the years, and the number of films that Nicolas Cage appears in. Well, if, if you wouldn't now think about, okay, a causal relationship, yeah, are things causally related with each other? You say, okay, well, the one thing goes up, the other one goes up. You could very easily make the mistake that there is a relationship. Now, these are so outlandish things that hopefully you understand that it doesn't make sense. Yeah? But sometimes things are not that clearly complete bollocks. Yeah? Well, I think I have a third one. Um, worldwide non-commercial space launches and sociology doctorates awarded in the US. Yeah. So. These are sort of relationships, they seem to be correlated with each other, but they are most definitely not causal. Yeah? Or I don't know, I, there's no, no good reason why that should be the case. These are spurious relationships. Spurious relationships. They seem to be going along with each other, but in fact, they don't. Yeah? So they're sort of an artifact. So how can that be? Yeah? How can that be that something seems to be so correlated with each other? Well, there are two big reasons for that. I'm going to jump into both of these a little more during this lecture. 
So again, what is the spurious relationships? Two events or variables x and y have no direct causal connection, yet it may be wrongly inferred that they do due to one of these two. Yeah? So like, I don't know, they seem to go along with each other, they are correlating. Coincidence and an unseen factor. Coincidence means sometimes things just happen. And sometimes things just happen at the same time. If you look long enough, you will find something that just happens. Yeah. And the thing is, so spurious relationships can, can come about through that. Things just happen. Things just happen. And the, the, the problem is that we often tend to find meaning in these things. Yeah. We just go there. But pure chance will make some things correlate with each other. Right? If you look long enough, you will find something that correlates with the number of movies that Nicolas Cage appeared in. If you look long enough, you will find something, even though there is no causal relationship with cheese consumption and people who die in their bed sheets by tangling themselves. I wonder how that works anyway. So, um, but when you see that, you don't see all the relationships that have not been, have not been associated with each other. So our mind is very selective in observing things. That's probably a good heuristic that we developed evolutionary at some point. You, know, you see something that, uh, that matters, what happens to you. But we're not really good in understanding all the things that don't happen. Because we don't see them. So this is sort of what we would call a selection, a selection effect that we have here. So I have a little, little example to, to um, I don't know, I want to spark you thinking about these kinds a little bit. And uh, so um, it is about birthdays. It's about birthdays. Again, it's about something that might happen or that might not happen and so on. So I have a little, little survey, little question for you. Yeah. So think of the following scenario. I think by now we have 500 students registered in this course. Now I think let's scale this down much, much more. Let's think about 30 students. Yeah. 30 students in the classroom, in your tutorial, yeah, it's after you go into your tutorial, there are 30 students in there. What do you think is the probability that two people in that room have birthday on the same day of the year? So what I mean by that is not they were born on exactly the same day in the year, you know, but sort of like, let's say their birthday is uh, the 10th of March, and, uh, um, and what is the probability that two people in that room have birthday on the 10th of March? or any other day during the year. So the chance that two people out of 30 have birthed you on the same day. Thing. You know, I was, I was, you know, I, I was telling this story to a friend of mine. We were sitting having, having a drink in the Bernard Shaw, and then this friend couldn't believe it and walked around and walked around and asked 30 people. He said, "Yeah, Thomas said this." Yeah. And funnily enough, some of the people there were actually my students from that year, so they actually already had heard the story, uh, because the probability for that is around 70 percent. I would bet my money on it. I would bet my money on it that in your tutorial this afternoon, two people have birthday on the same day. It's almost absolutely 100% that two people in this room here have birthday on the same day. How can that be? Yeah? How can that be? Well, here you see now, here I actually plotted the, the, the probability and the number of people that you have in the room. And uh, so now on the, on the x-axis, I have the number of people in the room. On the y-axis, I have the probability. So for 30 people, it's about, um, it's about uh, 70%. What the fuck? Yeah? <laughs> Why is that? Well, it's because all the stuff that we, you don't see. You don't see all the combinations of people that are there. And you don't see all the days when they actually could have birthday. Yeah, but they don't. So you always remember, okay, well, my birthday is on that day. Does anybody else have a birthday on that day? But it could have been any day during the year, and it could have been all the combinations of the people in there. 
right? It's one of those things, you know, you can do the math, you can read it, I don't know, you can just Google this thing, you know, people having birthday on the same day and so on. But what I wanted to use this for is for you to get an understanding about how, how bad we sometimes are in understanding randomness. And we go out in the world and we see patterns and then we, we attribute meaning to them. Two people at birth on the same day, oh, this must be such a coincidence. Yeah? But actually it's very likely that things just happen. Yeah? Here's the probability, so when you have more than 23 people, it's more than 50%. Yeah? So more than 23 people, school class size, chances is more than 50% that two people at birth on the same day. So it goes along a little bit with that idea. We all made these experiences, you know, that you go, you travel around, you go abroad, and you run into somebody from your tiny little village at the west coast of Ireland. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. And you wonder, what's, what's in all likelihood? Yeah? This is so unlikely. Well, true, this particular event is very unlikely. But the chance that you meet somebody who you met at some point in your life, at some point where you travel, over a whole life course. It's incredibly, incredibly high. Incredibly, incredibly high. It's almost certain. We all have these stories. We all have these stories, and you want, ah, oh, that's such a, such, a, such a coincidence that this happened. But you only remember having met that particular person. You don't remember not having met all the other 200 people that you know or that you could have met. But you didn't. So that's sort of how our brain is incredibly bad in dealing with, with with things that occur sometimes just by chance, sometimes things just happen by chance, and we attribute meaning to it. So that's something that people often struggle with, that there's sort of sometimes there are patterns, you know, and I don't know, we are sociologists, we want to find the meaning of society and how it all works and the patterns in it and so on. But, uh, but then sometimes some patterns just are there by chance. Like for example, the number of, I don't know, people who die in their bed sheets and the number of cheese that is consumed in a country. Okay, so sometimes things just happen by chance. I have another example about that, about randomness, uh, in, an, in a slightly different context. This is so, sometimes things happen together just by chance. Sometimes things happen, um, some, sometimes things don't happen, or there's a mistake. And the area where this is applied, and you have a big problem, is actually in, uh, in the testing for diseases. I'll talk more about that in a second, but first, as a little story and another question for you that challenges you a little bit in thinking about, about um, randomness. So now there's a little more text, let me summarize this. So uh, let me, let's assume you're worried about having a disease, a rare disease. And uh, you decided to get tested, you know, which is a sensible thing to do. Right. I think that's a very good thing to do, uh, especially at your age. Uh, and suppose that the testing methods for this disease are correct 99% of the time. Yeah? So it's actually a pretty accurate test. So 99% of the time, the test gives you the correct result. So let's say you have a disease, 99% of the time, the test, the test tells you that you actually have the disease. However, if you don't have the disease, it shows that you don't have the disease 99% of the time as well. Yeah? So it's very accurate, 99% of the time. The test is accurate. So now suppose that uh, the disease is actually quite rare. What does it mean? It doesn't happen that often. Yeah? In this case, uh, let's say one out of 10,000 people has the disease. Yeah? Or it could be uh, 100 out of a million. Uh, that would be sort of the equivalent. I just scaled it up. And actually, this goes very much in line with something like, for example, HIV. Now, HIV, is, uh, the prevalence is 450 in Ireland, which is 4.5 million. So that's actually one out of uh, 100 out of a million. So that's sort of what we call a rare disease. If you test positive you know, in this test for the disease, what is the probability that you actually have the disease? Well, most people say 99%, you know, well, the test is 99% accurate, right? This is what you would think. Wrong. Actually, the probability is less than 1%. Less than 1% for a test that is incredibly accurate. And that's a mistake that people often make. Yeah. 
How can that be? Well, here comes something into play, something into play that we call true and false positives. So let me walk you through this a little bit. So, um, so I said, first of all, it's a rare disease. So what, what does that come into play? Why should that matter, actually? Yeah, yeah. OK, so but think about it. One out of 10,000 people has the disease. We, know, we just know that. Yeah? We just assume that for, for the moment, for the time being. If we would scale that up, that would mean that 100 people out of 1 million people have the disease. Yeah? Okay, which would roughly be what, what you find in Ireland for HIV. Okay, so now we are saying that the test is 99% accurate. So now let's assume, okay, 100 people have the disease. We just pretend for a moment that we know that, right? So our test is 99% accurate. So that means 99 people out of those 100 people that actually have the disease are correctly classified as having the disease by this test. Yeah? So for this test, it would show up positive. One person, one person would get a negative result, although this person is actually positive on the test, or on the, on the disease. Yeah? One out of 100 would be wrongly classified. You say, okay, well, that's, that's sort of within what we would have thought about this test, 99% accurate. So, okay, so we get 99 true positives here. Now this thing with the rare disease comes into play. And that's sort of something that is very confusing for people. Again, we have 1 million people. I said that 100 people out of those 100, 1 million people have the disease. Yeah? Which means that 999,900 people don't have the disease. Yeah? They're perfectly healthy. Now the thing is, we said the test is 99% accurate, yeah? which is great. So in 99% of the times, you know, actually this, this, this means that 998,901 people, this test classifies the people correctly as disease-free. Yeah? This is what we would call true negatives. But in 1%, 1%, we have the wrong results. Now the thing is, now we're talking about 1% of a really large number, right? Because most people don't have it. That's sort of where this rare disease, rare event comes into play, which is very confusing, yeah? when, we, when we don't really think about that. We just think about percentages in a way. But that means 1% out of 999,900 people who actually have, the res have, have this disease will be wrongly classified as uh, uh, those people who don't have the disease, and 1% out of those will be wrongly classified as having the disease, while in fact they don't. It's just 1% where we make a mistake. But now we make 1% for a really large, a, a, a mistake and for a really large number of people. 1% out of that is 9,999. 9, so we have almost 10,000 people where we, where we wrongly say that they have a disease, while in fact they don't. Just because of this 1% error that we're making, but we're making this 1% error for a really large number of people that don't have it. Now we add these things up. Yeah. Sort of the true positives. We have the false positives. That means we, we, we will classify, I don't know, uh, over 10,000 people as, as, as positive through our test. Yeah. But we know that only 99 have it. So here we end up with less than 1% which is crazy. But that's exactly the reason why, when people actually get tested positive for HIV, there's always a second test, sometimes even a third thing. Or maybe you've wondered about, you know, when, you're, when you are in sports and somebody does doping, why do they always have an A sample and a B sample? You think, okay, well, the test is so accurate, 99%, they find some drugs, why do we need a B sample? That's the reason. That's the reason, and well, it's a little excursion. I think it's very funny anyway, and I wanted to, 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 to have that in my lecture at some point. Uh, but I think it also tells us, again, about how bad we are in thinking about randomness. Some things we just cannot see, right? Because we either don't experience them, you know, it's a very selective thing, or we just cannot factor in that, I don't know, some things just will happen anyway. And when they will just happen anyway, like a random error, or you know, sometimes things just happen by error or by mistake, for a large number of people, and it's still going to be a large number of people that, in this case, might be wrongly classified as having a disease, while in fact they don't. Yeah? 
Okay, so that's sort of a little excursion about coincidence and randomness, which is uh, a little strange, but, um, but the point that I want to make is that randomness is something that doesn't come intuitively to us. Or we think it does, we think it does. And it's very easy to make this mistake that we think we know it all, but actually we don't. Because we experience the world in a highly selective way. Yeah. We only see the people, uh, we only remember the people that we actually met. We don't remember the people that we haven't met. Okay, so that's coincidence. Let me move on a little bit to, uh, to the second thing I want to talk about um, in the context of spurious relationships, unseen factors. Yeah. Unseen factors basically means that something seems to be related with each other, yeah, X and Y, cheese consumption and Nicolas Cage, or actually let's take ice cream, consum ice cream uh, consumption and people who drown in a pool. Right? They seem to be, actually, I could show you a similar graph that they go up together, like that. And the unseen factor is something else, something, a third factor that affects both of these two things. Okay. So there's no really a relation between the two, but something else that affects both of them. Yeah. Sometimes we call that a common response, a third factor or a lurking variable. Yeah. So um, and it's just other names for it. So I have another example, I have another little video for you from The Simpsons, so let me quickly plug over and then... Uh, Going to see what the Simpsons say. Any suggestions? Round of layoffs might wake up the idiot. Here's what you in the water cooler. Mm, well, those are my ideas. You people don't think you regurgitate. That's why I promoted someone who's in touch with the workers. You. Uh, I think you mean him, sir. Uh, you then. How would you improve the worker situation? Well, uh, well uh, sir, for one thing, we had a problem every Tuesday when the cafeteria would serve fish. Fish sticks? What in glitches are you talking about? Well, sir, they cut the head off the fish and chop up the rest of the sticks and then put seasoned bread. I know what fish sticks are. Get to the point. Uh, well, you only get this tiny little cup of tartar sauce to dip in, and I always run out. Hey, stop wasting our time, Johnson. Shut up, Smithers. Can't you see what i a happy worker is a busy worker. Three cents worth of tartar sauce could save us thousands of man hours and they... I'd like the cut of your cheek, Simpson. Let the fools have their tartar sauce. Enjoy your tartar sauce, boys. Enjoy! Give me your place. Don't growl. Plenty for everybody. Mm. Brilliant. Who could ever have imagined that Simpson's sweeping reforms would pay off so quickly? You know, sir, accidents decreased by exactly the number that Simpson himself is an owner of a door cause last month, and, and our output level was just as high during Simpson's last vacation. My dear tired old Smithers, do I get a note of jealousy? <laughs> so again, uh, the Simpsons tell us so much about life, right? Um, what is the story here? What is the outline? So, you know, there's more tartar sauce, there's more tartar sauce on a Tuesday, and there are fewer accidents. Right? And then uh, Mr. Burns thinks, oh, that's great. Homer made it happen. It worked. Tata sauce causes fewer accidents. What is the thing here? Well, we have a spurious relationship. That's a spurious relationship. Now, caused by a third factor, by something else. Homer is in the kitchen. He's handing out the tata sauce. So he's not responsible for the security anymore, which causes both people having more tata sauce on their plate and having fewer accidents in, uh, in the power plant. That's a spurious relationship. Okay. Now I move on to the, to the third threat uh, for causality. We talked about this reverse causality thing and we talked about the Simpsons and the spurious relationships. So now let's talk about omitted variables. Omitted variables means, or we call it omitted variable bias, means that we are missing something that is important. We are missing something that is important in our analysis. And as you will see, missing something can actually, or forgetting something to including something in our analysis, can flip an observed relationship around. So omitted variables means two events, or variables x and y, are causally and directly related with each other. Right? So there's clearly the one causes the other. But there's also an indirect effect from x via z to y. Right? There's also something x causes something else and that leads to something else. 
and you'll see in a, in a, in a, in a minute um, what that means. And then forgetting, forgetting to consider that third factor, Z, right, this indirect relationship, when we look at the direct relationship, forgetting that in our analysis might lead to very wrong conclusions. Okay, I have two examples on this. The first one is on gender, gender inequality. So that's sort of a study, you know, funnily, it's so many jokes in this lecture that you don't even get. Um, there's, um, this in the literature, this is called Simpson's Paradox. Not because of the Simpsons, but because of a statistician, Edward Simpson. He discovered that, you know, there's an article written about that in Science, if you want to really look it up. Essentially, it was a study that they did where they looked at the admission rates of males and female applicants to graduate schools uh, at the um, University of California in Berkeley, right, in 1970, 73. So that's sort of what they wanted to know. They wanted to know, do, do males or females get admitted more often to the, to the graduate program uh, um, than the other gender? That's sort of what they looked at. And that's what they found. So this is sort of the raw data. You know, they had around uh, 12,000, 13,000 applicants uh, in 1973. And they looked at you know, uh, how many of them were male, how many of them were female, and they looked at the admission rates. And looking at the raw data, you know, it looked, it seemed that males get admitted more often into graduate school. So this, this looked as if there is a bias against females. Right? Looks like a discrimination against females. Males get admitted more often to grad school. Not only do they get more money at the end of the day, they also get admitted more often. It's another scam. At the end of the day, they also get admitted more often. It's another scam. Well, this is sort of uh, because we, uh, we, we, we forgot, we, we didn't include an important third factor, this relationship here um, turns out to be actually the opposite. So what they did now, instead of looking at the total number right, of who applies to, uh, to, to Berkeley, they looked at these numbers split up for the different departments. Right, so here are the, the, the six biggest departments that they had. And then they looked at the admission rates for, for men and women for each one of these departments. And now when you look at this data and you compare this stuff, you know, now in, in four out of six departments, women get admitted more often than men. How can that be? Didn't we just, didn't we just show that, uh, that males get admitted more often than females? Well, it is a paradox. It's an apparent paradox. It's called Simpson's Paradox. Right, so look it up if you want to. And Simpson's Paradox tells us we need to be very careful about drawing conclusions about individuals from information that we have about a population. So simply because we observe that, they are, that the admission rate for males seems higher than for females, it doesn't have to be like that at the individual level. Well, so the puzzle or the paradox that we have here is it seems that male applicants get admitted more often, but when looking at departments separately, it seems that female applicants get admitted more often. Well, what is the solution for, for this paradox here? It's an omitted variable. It's something else, a third factor that we didn't consider. And the third factor here is that some departments have lower acceptance rates than others, and females, at least in 1973, tended to apply to these departments with lower acceptance rates more often. So here you see the numbers. So in the English department, you know, 65% of the applicants were female, while in the mechanical engineering department, only 2% of the applicants were female. And the acceptance rates were much lower for the English department than for the mechanical engineering department. Now, when we look at the, at the, at the data, and if we, if we plot it, you know, this is sort of now, you know, on the, on the x-axis, we have the dots represent the different departments, you know, and the, the percentage of women applicants is on the x-axis, on the y-axis, the, the percentage of applicants admitted. Yeah, actually, now you see it's a, it's a negative relationship. So now the more, the more uh, females apply to a department, the, um, uh, the, um, um, uh, the, when, when more females apply, you know, they actually um, percent women applicants, percent applicants are admitted. I was confused. So it's admission rate. So admissions go down for females. So what is the third factor here? The third factor here is now the department choice. Right? That's sort of this third thing. Now it's not sort of this, this thing that causes both. 
but it's sort of this indirect relationship that we have going here as well. And if you would not consider this department choice, the, 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 the third factor here, um, then um, we would draw wrong conclusions about the nature of the relationship between gender and admission rates that we wanted to look at in the first instance. So that's sort of why it's really, it's really important. It's really important to think about the, these, these other factors that might play a role here, these indirect effects that could play a role here, and then we want to include them in our analysis. You know, there, are, there are ways to consider that. It's practically what we do. We control for that kind of stuff. You know? uh, essentially, we look at subgroups, like we did here before. We look at the different departments, look at, look at the admission rates here, and then we average them over all the departments. But these are statistical techniques, you know, like considering something in your regression, like, uh, like including some uh, more than one factor in, in your explanation. Let me give you another example, uh, which I think is also um, pretty striking and, uh, and important. So let's talk about uh, death penalties. Let's talk about death penalties and race. Death penalties and race. So there was this study, you know, 81, they looked at the effects of racial characteristics on whether individuals convicted of homicide, so they were all murderers, blacks and whites, and they looked at whether they received the death penalty. Right, uh, sort of the data, I mean, it's also old stuff, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this is sort of the, the relationship they looked at, right? The race of the offender and death penalty. And this is what they find. So, um, you know, they, they, they looked at a, a white, uh, a white defendants, or you know, these are sort of the the, the offenders and, and, and black offenders, and it seemed it seemed well almost the same or a little a little higher the percentage for for whites. So it seems that whites get sentenced to death more often than blacks. Okay, now I'm going to do something 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 similar as I just did before with the admission rates. So now, if you look at actually subgroups, now let's look at. It's now it's looking not just at the defendant's race, but also at the victim's race, right? So now these are the cases where the victim, the person who got murdered, was white. When we now look, this is exactly the same data. It's exactly the same data, but now only a subgroup, right? So the subgroup of where the victim was white. And when we now look at the data, you see that now actually uh, blacks get sentenced to death more often than whites. So now 70.5% of of those blacks who killed a white person get sentenced to death, while only 12.5% of whites who killed a white person get sentenced to death. And now the really crazy stuff is, when I look at the other subgroup, now let me look at the subgroup of the black victims, and now what we see, now it's the same thing. Well, first of all, we see that, which is another scandal, well, that was 1973, uh, fortunately a lot of things changed. First of all, uh, when, the black, when the victim was white, uh, when the victim was black, uh, the, the um, the death, is, uh, the death penalty was, uh, was given much less than when the victim was white, so there was clear, clear discrimination here. But then on the top of it, you see that now for this other subgroup, and now let me compare these two things, for this other subgroup where the victim was black, we also see that blacks get sentenced to death more often than whites. So now when we split our, our data up into these subgroups, right, and there are only two subgroups, one is where the victim was white, one is where the victim was black, in both cases, for both of these subgroups, we now observe that blacks get sentenced to death more often than whites. But didn't I just show before that whites get sentenced to death more often than blacks? Again, it's sort of the paradox. It's sort of the same structure as the ones that we had before. It's also the Simpson paradox. Paradox here is that it seems that whites get sentenced to death more often than blacks, but when splitting up the data according to the race of the victim, in both cases, black gets sentenced to death more often than whites. What is the solution for this paradox here uh, to, to resolve why that is the case? Well, again, it's sort of a third factor. It's a variable that we omitted, something that you didn't consider in our analysis. And here it is that whites tend to kill other whites. And killing whites is more likely to result in the death penalty than killing blacks. All right, so here we have sort of this relationship here now that uh, the race of the offender sort of uh, has an impact or, or sort of their whites tend to kill tell other white people um, in comparison to, to, to black people and that kind of leads then eventually to a, a reversal a reversal of the relationship that you observe in the first instance. So now I hope you, you, you understood that it's really important you know, when we see something that happened together, well first of all it might be just coincidence, second it might be a real association 
But even then, you know, when we imply some causality, we still need to be at, on edge, right? We still need to be very careful to conclude what is driving what here. And there are three threads that, uh, that are outlined. So there's a reading for Wednesday, um, and see you on Wednesday. Thanks very much.